Um, my name is Ian Waits, and I'm uh, our Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate and Graduate Education. And uh, welcome to McVicker Day and the McVicker Symposium, uh, which is where we celebrate um, some of our most uh, exceptional undergraduate educators at MIT. And I also want to um, highlight on this uh, very special day uh, that it uh, coincides with uh, International Women's Day, right? Which is a very nice thing since we're, at the same time that we're celebrating um, exceptional uh, teachers who are at MIT uh, today, it's obviously in recognition of uh, Margaret McVicker, who's um, you know, just obviously a, a, a fantastic uh, you know, contributor for so many years to MIT and created so many things, and I'll say a little bit uh, more about that. So it's nice that it coincides with um, International Women's Day. Uh, in terms of the agenda, um, I will uh, first uh, say a few words and share a few quotes to embarrass our new uh, uh, McVicker faculty fellows. And when I do so, I'm gonna ask you to come up and stand next to me um, so that you can face the um, the eyes of your peers while I em embarrass you. Um, and then uh, we will have a sort of lightning round uh, set of presentations on uh, thinking about the future of education and what MIT sort of should do or should keep doing um, about that um, as we go forward. Um, and that should be a lot of fun. We've got uh, four exceptional uh, faculty panelists and three exceptional student panelists, and we'll get to hear from each of them for about three minutes. So it should be a, a quick and fun and interesting um, session. So uh, let me start with uh, some introductions of our new fellows. Um, I just uh, first want to start and remind you of what um, being honored as a McVicker Fellow uh, recognizes, and it's to recognize faculty members who have profoundly influenced our students through their sustained and significant contributions to teaching and curriculum development. Uh, McVicker Faculty Fellows are appointed for a 10-year term, um, and we announce them on McVicker Day at MIT. Uh, so I will start with the first person uh, who is the um, only one of the four uh, fellows who is not here today. Um, as uh, typically happens, we lose one or two due to prior commitments with, um, you know, invited lectures and things like that. And that is the case for our first uh, fellow, uh, Josh Angrist. Um, Josh is the Ford Professor of Economics, and he's uh, director of MIT's School Effectiveness and Inequality Initiative. Um, and after completing his undergraduate grad degree at Oberlin, he did his master's and PhD from Princeton, and he began teaching at MIT in 1996. Um, I work closely with uh, Josh, so I know him uh, very well, and I'm just very pleased that he's been selected for this honor. Um, I'll share a couple uh, quotes from the nomination. Um, so uh, first, uh, quote, there's always a good argument for why the current way is the best way. To Angrist's credit, he pushed hard, made unpopular arguments, and coaxed and goaded the department to innovate in the undergraduate program. He has devoted his scholarship, pedagogy, and institute service to advancing teaching brilliantly, modernizing the economics curriculum broadly, and improving the MIT undergraduate experience at the institute-wide level. And this uh, comes from David Otter, the Ford Professor of Economics. Um, and from an undergrad, Stephanie Chang, um, I can wholeheartedly say that I would not be where I am today without Professor Angrist's teaching and mentoring, from teaching my first econome econometrics course, supervising my Europe, trusting me to TA his course, and advising my senior thesis, Professor Angrist was an integral part of my undergraduate experience and set me on my career path today. Um, and finally, um, another quote from a student in econometrics, we argue causality when there is an exogenous shock to the system. Professor Angrist is my exogenous shock. <laughs> it was a stroke of random luck that I took his 1432 class my sophomore spring, but that experience pushed me from a clueless undergraduate to a PhD candidate in economics, hoping to use econometric techniques to better the world. So in uh, Josh's absence, let's give him a round of applause.
And now let me invite Eric um, to come and stand with me while I say a few things about Eric. Um, this is Eric Demain, who's a professor in computer science and a member of CSAIL. Um, in 2001, at the age of 20, uh, Eric became the youngest faculty member ever hired by MIT. Um, he's been at the Institute ever since, and he has a wide range of interests. For those of you who know him, you know he's a, a MacArthur genius. Uh, he also has art displays in the Museum of Modern Art and the Smithsonian. Uh, in 2017, he helped construct a universal algorithm for folding origami shapes, a project that he had begun almost two decades prior. So let me share a little bit about what your nominators uh, said about you, Eric. Um, his meticulous lecture notes have become the gold standard for teaching in the field. His notes convey the magic of algorithms in a clean, crisp, and inviting, yet still complete way, says Konstantinos Daskalakis, who's a colleague of yours in uh, EECS. Um, from another colleague of yours, Srini Devadas, uh, quote, Eric has a joyful, energetic style of teaching that everyone loves. And uh, from a student, Amartya Biswas, uh, quote, Eric has been very helpful in writing up the results and has helped me polish and proofread my papers. He has always been available to meet weekly to discuss progress on new directions and on the write-up. It has been a pleasure being his student and doing research with him as an undergraduate. Um, and finally, I would just note that you're a living exemplar of what our president, uh, Raphael Reif, calls a bilingual learner, um, someone who combines or folds other disciplines and art with computation. So congratulations, Eric. Well done. Graham? Where is Graham Snake? Wonderful. How are you, sir? Good. So uh, Graham Jones is a associate professor of anthropology. Graham came to MIT in uh, 2010, following three years as a lecturer and postdoc of the Princeton Society of Fellows. And he, recent, he received his undergraduate degree in literature at Reed College before attending NYU to complete his PhD in anthropology. He's written two book, books about magic and teaching a course with the rather unambitious name of the meaning of life. Um, I've ha heard him speak about that, uh, in fact. So uh, this is what uh, nominators have said about Graham. Um, Graham is a talented scholar with an unquenchable passion for teaching. And that comes from his colleague, Susan Silby, who's sitting here. Um, Second quote, and this one from a student, and it's really a, a wonderful quote. It says, uh, I was searching for any way to get out of doing more P sets. <laughs> I wanted to write and think critically about the world. I wanted to feel like a human being whose experience and opinion matters. I actually didn't realize how much more I wanted out of my MIT experience until the first lecture I had in Professor Jones's class about culture. I think my head almost fell off in the middle of the class for how much I nodded along. <laughs> I was beaming, and it was the first class in my MIT career where I felt like the whole core of my humanity was being fully recognized. And this is from student uh, Gabrielle Ballard. Uh, from uh, another student, Alyssa He, uh, Professor Jones embodies MIT's mission to produce people who are not only competent technologists, but also socially conscious and poised to be leaders and critical thinkers. It is clear that he sees teaching as a true calling with significant social impact. And the last quote, um, also from a student, uh, Kayla Tab. Uh, and finally, it's hard to imagine a um, better compliment than uh, he transformed my goal of surviving MIT to thriving at MIT, so congratulations. So let me shake your hand one more time, super. Um, and TL. Our next um, honoree is TL Taylor. Um, TL is a professor of comparative media studies and co-founder and director of Research for AnyKey, an organization dedicated to supporting and developing fair and inclusive esports. 
Tiela received her bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and her MA and PhD from Brandeis University. Her classes such as CMS 614, Network Cultures, and CMS 616, Games and Culture, focus on how we interact with online environments. In addition to promoting inclusion within the esports community, um, she is also active in the Institute's First Generation Program, which champions students who are the first in their family to attend college. And this is what nominators said about you, TL. Um, quote, I was continually struck by her generosity and thoughtfulness and by her commitment to thinking deeply about the department's curriculum and the experiences, academic and otherwise, of our students. She has earned my admiration and respect by speaking up forcefully about the complexities of inclusiveness and equity during discussions on hiring, departmental initiatives, student concerns, and navigating the way forward as a growing and changing department. And this is from Professor Helen Lee, who's her colleague in CMSW. Uh, and the next one is from a student, uh, Stephen Suen. Um, quote, as a fabled humanities major at MIT, <laughs> a living oxymoron. Uh, there was no prescribed four-year curriculum for me. I was constantly being self-conscious about wasting my educational opportunities and second-guessing my choice of program altogether. As my advisor, TL helped me overcome that anxiety and embrace my intellectual curiosities. Even as I pivoted in my intended career path multiple times throughout college, she would always demonstrate genuine excitement for my growth and sit down with me to figure out how to make it work. And then finally, and this is from an alumnus, um, quote, with the benefit of hindsight, I can now say with certainty that it took me two years to realize that TL was completely correct about my passions, skills, and what I want to do in the future. I continue to seek her advice even after MIT because she remains just as accessible and compassionate as she was when I was at MIT. Congratulations, T.L. Thank you. Okay. So really some fantastic um, new additions to the group of uh, McVicker Fellows. I want to transition now to uh, the subject of the symposium, and that's to think about what is an educated student um, and uh, what should we um, do or continue doing um, to help um, uh, promote that. But I want to go back and uh, at least share what one very important person uh, thought about that uh, question. And this, of course, is uh, Margaret McVicker. Um, and uh, this is a quote from an article in the Boston Globe, and I'll, I'll read it. It says, uh, McVicker says that science and math students should have a balanced education through course content as well as personal example to learn skills such as weighing values, developing character, and pursuing truth without compromise. Um, and she said that in 1986, um, more than 30 years ago. I also want to use this as an opportunity to highlight uh, two of our special guests. So. Uh, Victoria McVicker, sitting right over here. And Susan Kendra, her friend. Hi, Sue. Um, Victoria is Margaret's sister. And uh, most years, when the travel works out for them, uh, they come up and join uh, McVicker Day uh, and honor uh, Victoria's sister, um, and it's great to see you again here. We um, get to go out and have a nice lunch before this, so we've had an opportunity to sit down and talk about um, dogs and all things dogs and all things dogs. Um, <laughs> and I just want to thank you for coming up here today, especially uh, for those who don't know, they come from Florida, and so they've hit an unusually cold patch in Boston, e even for, for Boston. So. Um, uh, very nice to see you both again, as always. Um, so this question of uh, what is an educated student is something that we've been asking for some time. Um, Europe is 50 years old, um, and again, a huge credit to Margaret McVicker um, for leading the effort to uh, get that in place. Um, ESG is 50 years old. Uh, Interface is 50 years old. So there was this period, in fact, Kate Weishauer, who's up here, has written a little 
few pages on this, there was a period in the late 60s and early 70s when there was tremendous experimentation and change at, at MIT of an educational nature. Um, and I think, I, I sense that we're in a period where there's a lot of uh, experimentation and change again. Um, and some of that uh, is obviously led by efforts we're making in the first year, some led by our faculty officers who are um, encouraging us to think about um, what the future uh, should be for an MIT education. Um, so it's an interesting time, uh, 50 years after these things were created, um, to begin talking about or to continue the conversation about education in the 21st century. So um, the way it will work with our panel is that they're going to answer two questions in three minutes. It's not easy um, to do so. The first question is, what is important to a 21st century undergraduate education? Uh, the second is, what skills, ideas, and experiences should students expect to leave college with? Okay. And I'm going to introduce them each to, to you and ask them to come up here and sit. And then we'll go through, and there's actually even a clock that they're going to have to pay attention to as we go through this lightning round of, of thoughts and ideas. So let me first introduce Casper Hare. Casper? Casper is professor of philosophy, and you can come and sit up here, Casper, uh, in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy. He teaches a very popular MOOC on edX called Introduction to Philosophy, God, Knowledge, and Consciousness. Our next speaker is Divya Gall. Um, Divya is uh, graduating in June. That's what a 19 after your name means, which is great. Um, and she's uh, uh, 18 and 6, mathematics and computer science. And she's a managing partner of Flux, MIT's first undergraduate-focused accelerator, which runs during the school year and is founded to build stronger student entrepreneurs with the help of other motivated, like-minded students. Thank you, Divya. Our next speaker is Sanjay Sarma. Um, Sanjay is the Vice President for Open Learning at MIT, and that includes the Office of Digital Learning, the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative, and the Abdul Latif Jamil World Education Lab. He's also the Fred Fort Flowers and uh, Daniel Fort Flowers Professor of Mechanical Engineering and an expert on the Internet of Things. Uh, our next speaker, Fadi Atia, Fadi, um, is uh, a junior in physics, and he provides program support for the MIT React Hub, which is an initiative which was launched in May 2017 and focuses on refugee education. Next speaker is Michael Sipser, Dean of our School of Science, and the Barton Weller Professor of Mathematics, and he is the author of a widely used textbook, Introduction to the Theory of Computation. Katie O'Neill. Katie, welcome. Uh, Katie is also graduating uh, this June. Uh, she's in BCS, and she is a Marshall Scholar and will be heading to Oxford uh, to pursue masters uh, through research in experimental psychology. And finally, Susan Silby. Susan is chair of the faculty and the Leon and Ann Goldberg Professor of Humanities, Sociology, and Anthropology. Professor of Behavioral and Policy Sciences at the Sloan School of Management, and she's written groundbreaking papers on topics such as why do women leave engineering. So welcome um, each and every one of you. And I think our plan is to take this in the order that you're seated here. Um, and I will uh, welcome you, Casper, to start us off. Awesome. Do I talk into this mic or this mic? You've got a lapel. I got a lapel mic so I can run. OK, great. So um, uh, thank you so much. When I was asked these questions, initially my first instinct was to talk about the shortening, shortening attention span of the American student and how to like, uh, manage and exploit that, if possible. You know, uh, 100 years ago, in your free time, the students would spend like you know, 10 hours reading a novel. 50 years ago, it was two and a half hours watching a movie. 25 years ago, it was half an hour watching a TV show. And now it's like six seconds watching a GIF. Um, and then. Uh, <laughs> And, and, then, and then I was told that I, ha I had like three entire minutes to fill with this. And I, I thought you'd all be bored to tears if I, if, I, if, I, if I did this. So I said taking on a meteor topic, that would work. OK, so um, uh, we at MET, we, we're supposed to have, like, you know, the students are supposed to be beavers. What does that mean? Well, that means several things. But it includes you're supposed to be workers. That's the idea. But what is it? To, uh, we're educating these workers. What does it mean to educate a worker? 
Um, you look back through history, you'll see some very different attitudes towards the history of work. Basically, two sort of uh, contradictory narratives. There's one narrative which you know dates back to like at least 10,000 years, the agricultural revolution, according to which work is basically work is something you do to satisfy your needs, and work sucks. Um, you know, so Genesis has it that when Adam and Eve are expelled from the, the Garden of Eden, their punishment is that they have to work the soil. Um, Aristotle said that, you know, that um, uh, if you want to do anything, achieve any kind of flourishing or any kind of uh, achieve anything worthwhile in life, you have to be rich because only the rich are free of work. Uh, Jesus had a slightly different take on it, according to which <laughs> you had to be poor and indeed renounce all the, the, your material needs in order to like, be, uh, avoid the spiritual pollution of work. But anyway, whatever it is, work is bad. And that has, to some degree, su survived even to this day. You know, I, I'm, I'm actually old enough to have known people who talked condescendingly of the working classes, by which they meant anyone who works. Um, now, <laughs> so what, what is... Uh, so the hope, if you buy into that narrative, is that technology will like free us of the, uh, the uh, substantially free us of the, the obligation to work. There's also been a uh, contradictory narrative. The other narrative says, which you know, goes back at least as far as the Renaissance and Martin Luther, which is that through work you find salvation. So look at Michelangelo, look at Shakespeare. They were working for money. They did some pretty awesome things, contrary to what Aristotle said. And, um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, this is, this is great. This is great. This is the way to achieve meaning in your life and achieve stuff is working with purpose. And, you know, if you're worried that we're going to uh, lack the needs to be satisfied, well, we have an advertising industry and human psychology which will continue de generating perceived needs uh, for as long as you want. And so though this obligation to work will continue within us. So that's basically the, the, the two uh, uh, kind of strands. And the dominant strand for the 20th century was uh, the work is good, work is how we find meaning. Basically, either in your time, you're either at leisure, in which case you're consuming, or you're at work, in which case you're producing, and might as well be a producer rather than a consumer. But that wave has largely kind of broken in the 21st century and is going to break further. Um, we're seeing, I think, and we're going to continue to see the decline of the age of work. So well, what does that mean? It means that if you look nowadays, um, uh, Contracts are shorter, careers are shorter. Um, you'll see that uh, the internet has blurred the line between ho home and work. You'll see that um, uh, increasingly, if, you know, in 10, 15 years' time, you call somebody on the phone, you ask, are you working? The answer is increasingly likely to be, I don't know. I haven't thought about that, am I? <laughs> um, and, um, and so the question is, how do we, how do we deal with this? I, I regard this as largely a very good thing. I'm more in the, sort of the Aristotle way of thinking than I am in the... Martin Luther way of thinking about this, but how do we, like, what does this mean vis-a-vis -vis education at MIT? So uh, what I think it means, there's obvious stuff about, well, uh, it means that you're going to have to, did I just lose my, no. Um, there's obvious stuff about, well, it means that you're, you're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to uh, acquire various skills to adapt to a more flexible workplace and all that. I, I'm not so interested in that. Um, the skill that we really need to uh, imbue in students so as to deal with this uh, new situation, this new post-work age that they're going to find themselves in, is the skill of identifying what you want, asking, why do I want this? And asking, is it worthwhile, this thing that I want? And so this is, that's the end of my three minutes, and that's what I think we should be aiming to give our students in the post-work age. Um, so I am a computer science and economics student, and so I spent a lot of time the last few months thinking about how those two things go together. And I want to talk a little bit about one of the things that's been on my mind. Um, so one of the hallmarks of the 21st century is acceleration. The rate at which we're identifying and solving new problems is dramatically increasing. And historically, there was this model that technologists would solve a problem, and then humanists might have to work within the bounds of that solution to mitigate any new problems that created. So, you know, we created nuclear weapons and then we were faced with all these paradoxes of the defense and destruction of humanity. And so what I believe is that as this acceleration is becoming faster and faster, this model is no longer going to be sufficient. We can't have these two groups be so separate and we need the minds who are developing advanced technologies to be looking at these problems through technologist lens and a humanist lens. 
So um, one example I like to talk about is something maybe some of you have heard of. There's this program that's being used to um, predict recidivism rates for defendants. And so judges are using this program in order to make sentencing decisions, but it's been shown that this program has a tendency to overpredict recidivism rates for black defendants and underpredict for white defendants. And I think what this shows is that we're training machines based off of human choices, decisions that we've made in the past, and humans are flawed. So essentially, if we're just training machines to take our old decisions and uh, create a new body of expertise off of this, all we're doing in the end is offloading responsibility. This is the kind of problem I'm talking about. I'm focusing on an issue I understand, computer science, but I think this really goes far beyond computer science into all the disciplines at MIT. Um, so, you know, well-intentioned people can sit around, debate how to solve this problem, come up with solutions, but I think the really important thing is that those with, te with technical knowledge need to be invested in these problems because they're the ones who need to implement the solutions. They need to understand the importance up front. They need to design systems with this idea in mind. And so as MIT is producing students that are capable of solving problems and building amazing new technologies, I think MIT also has a responsibility to teach us how to use those talents and use that knowledge with principle. Um, now, I don't mean like adding an ethics class. Uh, it'd be really easy for MIT students to sit around and you know, write a paper about the trolley problem. Um, <laughs> but I, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is the practice of ethics. Um, in all of our like small like problem set assignments or any any work we're doing and sort of developing that mindset throughout our four years at MIT. Um, just I think we've been talking recently a lot about how computing spans across all disciplines. I think ethics needs to take a similar role and span across all the decisions we make as students. And it's already happening. There's graduate students that are working on problems like how do you take an autonomous vehicle that's been in an accident and decide who gets blamed for this? Um, there's people working on these issues in the undergraduate curriculum. There's um, some of the majors, like Course 20 and 22, already have an ethics requirement. But um, what I would love to see and what I would love to talk more about is extending this thinking into all of our undergraduate majors and classes and really making this a foundational piece of MIT. You know, it is, I believe that um, learning and really understanding what it means to learn is going to be a central skill for us, but also a, pre a matter of self-preservation. Um, I'll start with a story. I was in China a few months ago, and I was with Robert D. Simone, the professor of uh, brain and cognitive science, and he is like Alex Trebek in China. Yeah. An, uh, and most people don't know this. And the reason is he's a judge on a show where they uh, judge these extraordinarily talented people who can do things like divide 11 digit number by a nine digit number in their heads. So I asked, um, I asked Alex Trebek, I mean, <laughs> Robert De Simone, I said, uh, I said, Bob, how do they do it? He says, this is what I think they do. These folks, first they practice with an abacus, real abacus. Then they can do the abacus in their head. And then eventually the abacus goes away and stuff just happens. And to me, that is true learning. And I think that if you look at the 21st century and where we need to go, we need to become learning machines. Because blockchain was hot two years ago. It was even hot last year. But suddenly, if you're a blockchain specialist, you need to be learning something new, I'm afraid. Right? So that's point number one. Point number two uh, this is more of a sort of a cognitive psychological insight that follows from what uh, um, Bob de Simone told me. Men's at manus, we all take it for granted. But it turns out there's a whole field of research called embodied cognition. It turns out that if you do something, you learn it analytically and then you do it by hand, you learn it better. There's an experiment done by Professor, uh, Professor Sean Bielak, who's now the president of Barnard College. What she did was she taught uh, angular momentum to two groups of students, randomized control trial. But one group, they spend less time in lectures and more time just holding a spinning wheel. That's it. The second group learns better. Final comment. The human being is a learning machine, actually. We're born for that. Our kitten, we had a kitten. We got a kitten a few years ago, much against my wishes. That's a whole other story. But um, <laughs> the kitten barely saw its mother, but it was hardwired to hunt. 
but the human baby is completely helpless until 30, I don't know, 25, 20, I don't know. <laughs> and the reason is we are evolved to learn so that we can adapt from circumstances as wide and as widely sort of dis uh, uh, separated as the Sahara or the, or the Arctic Circle, right? And so we are evolved to learn. And in the 21st century, I think we will have to really hone the skill and develop frameworks so that, you know, if you're Al Oppenheim, who, by the way, thinks in Hankel transforms, or Dinah, who thinks in Shakespearean terms, or Susan, who thinks as a framework for thinking about things in, in an anthropological sense, we need to be able to develop these instincts and exercise them as we change from job to job as the world changes, up, changes on us. Thank you. So uh, when I was in middle school, I was a good student. I was able to uh, get, uh, get good grades. But the workload was not trivial. When high school came in, I participated in the Mathematics Olympiad, which exposed me to different ways of thinking about quantitative problems and uh, taught me problem-solving skills. Uh, surprisingly enough that after this experience, uh, workload became significantly easier, not only in mathematics, but also in physics, chemistry, biology, and even history, because I was able to do memorization better through drawing logical connections between historical events. So my point here is that problem solving is the most generalizable set of skills I acquired and I'm still acquiring. What sets the 21st century apart from previous times is the rate at which it's changing. The skill set that is required for both job market as well as research is changing ever so rapidly. And a more interdisciplinary approach is being needed more and more. Uh, thus, an ideal 21st century education would prepare students not only through giving them more information, but specifically by teaching them how to solve difficult problems. MIT has done a really great job in giving its students the flexibility to engineer their own majors and to take courses across different departments. As an example, since my journey began at MIT, I took courses in mathematics, physics, and computer science, which gave me three different points of view of looking at quantitative problems. As a more concrete example, my three favorite courses so far are at MIT are mathematics for computer science, taught by, taught by Professor Albert Meyer, theory of computation, taught by Professor Michael Sipser, and algebraic combinatorics taught by Professor Alexander Posnikov. The reason be behind my admiration for these courses is first, they don't require an advanced mathematical background to understand the material, and second, they rely heavily on problem-solving skills. So my suggestion is that maybe MIT should design a course specifically and only tailored to enhance pr uh, problem-solving skills. In fact, there's already a course that exists, and it's called 18A34 and it's for preparing students for the Putnam exam. However, the level of problem solving that is required for this course is extremely high. So as a final suggestion, maybe MIT can design problem solving courses not only for this level, but for all different levels. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, so the 21st century student. The 21st century student leads a very different life than the one I remember as an undergraduate uh, 45 years ago. Um, time, as people have already commented, time has compressed. But I also think that expectations have risen. Boredom is conquered by the dazzling online world with all of its information and games and emails and videos. The online world is truly wonderful, um, but it is changing us deeply. Like others, I worry about a darker side. What of our humanity is getting lost along the way? That is why, among the many tempting choices for what to talk to you about today in my three minutes of lightning, or enlightening, um, I will say that what we as educators need to offer our 21st century students is a human experience um, to nurture their souls and to help them grow as people. So just from a purely pragmatic standpoint, employers these days value soft skills as much as they value technical expertise. Um, our students must be able to collaborate on a team, cooperate with their colleagues, 
and communicate clearly. Those skills require empathy, the ability to see things from the other's point of view. Similarly, our students need inspiration, caring, um, curiosity, and courage. How do students develop these qualities? Well, they get them from their families, their friends, um, uh, their um, community, and yes, they get them from their teachers. So our role as teachers goes far beyond just the conveying of information, um, like the uploading of skills into brains like in the movie The Matrix. Um, the conveying of information can be also seen as a scaffold for a broader experience whereby students um, learn how to think and, and how to be. So I teach theory of computation. It's a large lecture subject every fall. Um, and I aim for that broader experience uh, by working to connect with my students. Um, I take them a kind of an, as a guide on a journey. Uh, at least that's how I think about it in my lectures and my office hours. Um, I feel like we're all in it together. Um, I follow the golden rule applied to teaching, which is to teach others as you'd like to be taught yourself. Um, so that broader experience occurs throughout MIT, um, in classrooms and labs, um, from projects and discussions, and late night piece set solving sessions. It's really about human interaction. Our students are amazing people, and we are so privileged to have them. They love MIT. They really do. I know I have one of them. My son is one of them. And He's very happy here. I see how my advisees struggle, yet they thrive and they grow. We're, we are doing something right here, but we also need to improve. That's something we must do. But, but we also need to keep sight of the success that we actually already have. So we should be mindful to keep that MIT magic along the way. Thanks. Can you hear me? Great, okay. So, I don't know why I believe half the things I do. Much of my world is built on these untested assumptions, and this may or may not be a problem. I consider this a success. In case you're wondering why I consider this a success, it's because I feel like I actually have a pretty good handle on the other half of things. So, thanks, MIT. <laughs> I came to MIT as but a wee nerd, excited to have resolved the greatest fundamental struggle of my life. Should I study neuroscience or literature? Really, I just wanted to understand what makes human beings the idiosyncratic nonsense monsters that we are in as many ways as possible. But at the tender age of 18, I thought I had to dedicate myself fully to a single discipline. So here I was at MIT, ready to fMRI my way to a fundamental understanding of the human mind and brain. Much to freshman Katie's chagrin, that's not quite how it turned out. I thought that the most important parts of my MIT education would happen in the lab. And don't get me wrong, many of them have. I actually cried the first time I watched a mouse running around its maze, looking at its brain through a fluorescence microscope, watching neurons light up in real time as she decided what type of chocolate milk to drink. But I digress. When I first got here, I thought my required humanities classes, well, fun for the part of me that sneaks iambic pentameter into boring lab reports, would be utterly useless for my scientific education. I even joined in with my friends as they complained about Haas classes being a waste of time. Yeah, weren't we here to learn how to be better scientists and engineers? So uh, imagine my horror when I realized that my humanities classes were actually the ones that have most informed who I am as a scientist. Science is about asking interesting questions and answering them in well-controlled ways. As it turns out, understanding the social influences that shape your understanding of the world is pretty important to asking and answering those questions. Let's take the example of how many of us treat maleness as a default, as an unmarked state. This translates pretty well to the way a lot of animal model neuroscience is done. Many funding agencies prefer studies run with an all-male cohort of mice to control for hormonal effects. Uh, when you scratch the surface, however, this does not pass muster. In fact, fetal testosterone protects against many genetic disorders in male mice only. This makes developmental studies that don't include female mice, to use a technical term, royally screwed. And yet, it took a discussion of feminist epistemology in my literature and philosophy course for this to even register as an issue. 
You can feel free to roll your eyes or call me a bad scientist for not noticing, but these kinds of realizations, scaffolded by the ethos of a humanities education, show up in every discipline. Think about the fact that we've only started recently digging into gut microbiome research. That makes a lot of sense when you think about the fact how a bunch of non-human DNA swimming around in your stomach having unknown effects on your thoughts and feelings is really, really freaky when you've been raised on rugged individualism. <laughs> or let's think about the laughable notion that machine learning algorithms should somehow be unbiased. This is rooted in part by the assumption that rational decision making is the pinnacle of human achievement. There are strong arguments to be made that fine motor control actually takes that prize. So when I tell you that I don't understand where many of my assumptions about the world come from, this is a good thing. It means that my time at MIT, and particularly my humanities education here, have forced me to examine the lenses through which I view the world a lot more closely. So I may not have my fundamental understanding of the human mind and brain yet, but I think that's a pretty good start. So what should the 21st century undergraduate education be? I want to make two points. First, I believe that the 21st century education is the same as the 20th century education is the same as the 19th century education, exploring across subjects and burying deep in some. At its core, excellent education is about learning how to learn. Trite, I understand, but the problem doesn't go away. And it is more about developing habits of mind and imaginative and disciplined inquiry than about the particular substantive information, the theories, or the tools that we master. Most important, as I think we've already heard from some, is that education should destabilize our taken for granted habits, I'm sorry about that, to provide multiple lenses with which to encounter the world. We could talk about education as a process of preparing for change or having the capacity to imagine alternative worlds, as MIT likes to say, to make a better world. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced we do. What just happened? OK, when I wanted to say we don't do it, the phone, the microphone went down. OK. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think, however, we can make our students' lives better for the basic reason that getting an education, whether at MIT or anywhere else, is that is a good in and of itself. Education is good unto itself. It is better to be educated than not to be. Now, not only because the data all show that you'll earn a higher living, you'll have longer lifespan. Education is better because it makes each moment of living different. Education creates new instincts, habits of looking for new meanings, of questioning old ones, of perpetually playing with and fighting about the meanings that we assign to events and texts and phenomena. It is about being able to hold two different points of view at the same time. It is about making each experience of life slower, more complex, engaged, and experiencing the enduring quality of the present. This is not a new vision of education, and I don't really think we need a new one. We have to be more faithful to this old one. So my second point is, what should MIT do about this? I think we should recognize that education is not professional training for a job. We should push back on problem solving and embrace critical thinking. We should resist generalization and embrace variation. We should push back on the pressure to turn education into occupational training if for no other reason that within five to 10 years, if I'm wrong, make it 15 years, but certainly within that frame, engineers or history majors are unlikely to be doing anything that they studied in college, and this is not new. 
There is abundant evidence showing that there is not much correlation between a student's college curriculum and her eventual job or career route. I fear that this commitment to fundamental education, even in science and engineering, is being challenged too forcefully and successfully and with too great velocity, if I got that, I'm not sure I can do the equation for velocity. I might have the wrong term. But the push for disruptive innovation, for entrepreneurship and profit, rather than for truth, for critical thinking, and for empathy. Across the nation, there are predictions about the demise of the humanities, precisely because of the success of disruption, entrepreneurship, profit, and what we might call the consequences of computing and the digital transformation of everyday life. The colleges and universities across the United States are closing departments of humanities for more training. And then they call for interdisciplinary training. Where's the other points of view supposed to come from? Last week's celebration of the founding of the MIT Schwarzman College of Computing, I heard something a little bit different, and I hear some of it on this panel. Maybe this is the time to rethink the relationship of science and engineering to the humanities, but not just as dessert. And so I'll end with a challenge. The problem is not whether the autonomous car should hit the trolley car or the pregnant lady, or you'll excuse me, who bears tort liability? Why are we building autonomous cars in the first place? We're not doing anything about the climate of equal scale, I would suggest. The sea is rising out there on the Charles River, and we don't have any worthwhile public transportation to start with. So why are we building autonomous cars? That's the question. Wow, super, super comments. Um, I was just like, it was fantastic. So, so thank all of you. Um, we have uh, time for some questions of our panelists. Um, so please uh, let, it's, we have two mics here, so since we are recording this, I would encourage you if you have a question to come to the mic. Hi, thank you for all your uh, talks. I found them very interesting. My question is about um, our current, our students now and how they acquire information and how they acquire information different from how they used to acquire information. Whereas now there's not so much context. So when I was a grad student, I'd look through journals, I would look through books, I would understand the context of the information. And now it's more defined by key terms and Google searches where you don't get that overarching context of where an argument comes from. And so how do we think about this in relation to our pedagogy and our classes? You require that they do it. <laughs> a little authority is not necessarily a bad thing. Teacher can say, I want you to do X, Y, Z, so go to the library. That's always in my assignments. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll say something that sounds terribly cliched, um, which is not new, but anyway. Um, I think that we need to think of ourselves less as an institution for higher learning and more uh, higher education and think of ourselves more as an institution for higher learning. In other words, it's not about, you know, I mean, education is like a factory. You just sort of pump stuff out. And we need to focus on learning because, as I said earlier, learning is, uh, in my view, fundamental, but it also encourages things like critical thinking and assessing different points of view and seeing if it's, the information is right or if it's complete or looking for dissonance and so on. I feel like that's getting lost because it's all about training, you know, with the new thing, so. I'll say something. I think the point about context is perfect, and that's exactly what has been missing in 
lots of machine learning and the point that was made about the bail, the bail data. Um, any sociologist or anthropologist could have told you what the pattern in bail setting is. We didn't need major computers to say that there is racial and class bias in bail setting. And so what we have, by the division of labor and the allocation of resources for research, is that we have people who don't know anything about the criminal justice system studying and making recommendations when any student who'd been through an undergraduate class in law and society or criminology, sorry for talking about my own stuff, but would know what the pattern in bail setting is. But the resources all go to the computer scientists to now learn our subjects. So they're learning on the job, and we're being put out of work. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not going to sound. I, I think my students are better every year. My MIT students. I, I have more fun every, like almost every passing year. They seem more engaged in um, the kind of thinking that I do, and I encourage them to do. And um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think. Well, each year I can almost say that this last year has been the best year I've been at MIT. One thing I've been reflecting on as a senior is the difference in the students I've seen around me just from freshman year to now and what their interests are. So I think when I came to MIT, um, everyone I knew was very focused on, you know, we're going to be course six, course 18. Um, we're going to, you know, spend our summers interning in the Bay Area, like leave, make good money, whatever. Um, and I think and I'm talking about even the same people now, four years later, and how they think about their lives and what they want to achieve. I've seen a huge shift. Um, I have so many more friends that are thinking about going to law school or pursuing graduate school in economics or political science and things that I never would have heard come out of their mouths when they started at MIT. Um, and so, I mean, that gives me some hope that there's something, there's some sort of conversation happening here that is helping us make those decisions and hopefully that that can continue and you know go beyond just the small group of people that I know uh, and really affect the whole school yeah, I'm actually I agree with Casper I uh, thank heavens for the new uh, generations because I mean every year I find students are more thoughtful more sensible you know compared to the brat I was you know more mature uh, more caring I, I'm uh, very optimistic actually so maybe I can answer this uh, question through my experience, uh, through my background. Uh, I'm an international student, and I spent the first 18 years in Syria, actually. So the educational system that, that I was exposed to uh, was extremely different from the educational system that MIT has. Uh, the education for the first 18 years of my life was basically based on memorization and uh, not a lot of understanding. So I mean, after spending all this time uh, there, I kind of, my whole perception, uh, I, I got maybe too pessimistic, let's say, uh, because I didn't see anything uh, better. But then when I heard about MIT and I, and I applied and I like, got in and then I was exposed to the, what a real education can be, uh, that in, in itself, like the change of the quality of the education that I was exposed to in itself made me more optimistic by meeting inspirational teachers and by actually taking courses that make you like focus on understanding is that you have to look at maybe at the other side of the world to appreciate how high of like how high the quality of education here so yeah that's why i'll just answer this through my own uh lens um you know i teach a course um theory of comp computing um and you know you might think well because it is computing in the name, so everybody's going to want to take the class. But in fact, what my class is about is the things you can't do with a computer. It's about the limits of computation. And it's really not a very practical class, despite the title. <laughs> um, but 
uh, it's, you know, students really like it. Uh, you know, they really just, you know, I, I have a huge enrollment there. I had, you know, 175 students in the class last term. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I'm a, you know, I, I'm a good teacher. I acknowledge that. But, you know, I think the, <laughs> the students have a joy of learning. And it's just a pleasure to see. And so that, that, that's what that, what's makes me optimistic. Um, so I'm a freshman advisor. So every year I get to see someone's first interaction with academic humility. <laughs> the first time someone comes across a problem they don't know how to solve, that they can't Google and find a solution for, um, and that they actually need to sit down, do some research, and figure out how to answer, and how they come apart from that experience as a different learner. That's something that makes me mildly optimistic. <laughs> So I'll speak from experience, a narrow experience also. I started teaching a class, I think it was 2009. It was an experimental class called the Social Science of Energy. It was for MITE, the Energy Initiative. And we taught it together, three of us, for five years. And when we began in 2009, I think that was the first year, uh, most of the students came because they were interested in energy and energy production. And one had to work a little hard to show the relationship between how we produce energy and environmental consequences. And even the, um, uh, when we did economic equations to show present value for what would be a future uh, good from solar or uh, hybrid cars, or now we have electric cars, the equations sort of showed they weren't worth the investment. By the time I stopped teaching it in 2000, and I think it was 2014, the class was completely filled with people committed to environmental sustainability, and the whole focus changed. So in those five years, I got some hope. This one. Um, yeah, Hazel. Yeah, use the mic if you can. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for these really interesting comments. Sanjay will know why I'm asking this question. But like you, I didn't get my education here in the United States as an undergraduate. I got it in South Africa, and it was very much a rote memorization education. And it's been extraordinary to be on the MIT faculty and to understand our education system and to teach it and to have it sort of become part of me and see how our students grow up to be really thoughtful problem solvers. When we look around the world, though, you know, most places are not MIT, and they don't have our philosophy and our mechanisms. And I have a question for whomever of you would care to answer, which is if there was one thing that you would like to take from MIT that you think we should give to universities across the world who are more like the university I came from, or perhaps like your university in Syria, or many universities that do not have our kind of problem-solving framework, what would it be? What would be the one thing from MIT that you think would be a really valuable gift to other places? Do you want to start? Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, that, sorry. I think that's a really hard question. I, I, it seems really hard for me to think of one thing uh, to, to give, like, to, give to uh, other places one thing from MIT. But um, can I think about this for a second? I'm just thinking. For, I'm just trying to choose one I'll thing. I'll find by you some time. OK. Um, I think it is curiosity. Uh, I think it is unfettered curiosity. You know, if you even in the English language, we have all these expressions to douse and smother curiosity. Curiosity killed a cat. All good things come to those who wait. You know, things like that. I mean, you're. You know, I grew up in India, and curiosity is not encouraged. It's it is disruptive. And I think we need to make it legit again. Um, so I think I figured it out. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I think the ability to, uh, for, for instructors, the ability to uh, implant passion 
into students. I think one major thing when I was in Syria that was missing is that uh, to a very extreme degree, people, all they cared about was the grade. And basically, the admission to universities after high school was also based on your grade and only your grade. So for example, you go to medical school if you're above a, a certain threshold. And if you're below that, you don't go to medical school. And if you don't go to medical school, then your future is not as bright as if you go to medical school. Uh, so the educational system was basically just uh, based on how to get that grade, how to maximize that grade. Nobody, it was very unfortunate, for example, to see a lot of students who are studying medicine who don't really care honestly about medicine itself or about biology. Just, they just want to go to medical school. Uh, so uh, the one thing that I saw at MIT that I didn't see when I was in Syria is the ability for instructors to implant passion into their students. I think that's, uh, that's, like, that's the thing that I would... Um, so my family uh, is also from India and a few months ago I was back in India talking to some of my cousins and I think one thing that really struck me there is I have one cousin who you know, he, as he, when he was growing up he would always be fixing everything. Uh, we always thought he was going to be a mechanical engineer uh, but he didn't like school and so kind of like what Fadi has just said you know his grades weren't great. Um, it's a very competitive environment and you know he didn't, he didn't end up going to college and now I, you know, I haven't seen him in a few years, so I went to India this time. It's the first time I've seen him since this happened. And um, he doesn't have the spirit that he used to have, that he has the ability to create something of himself and to do something, even though the skills that he already had could be used to do so many things without, uh, without that college education. Um, and I see that without, you know, this is like one example, but even my cousins who have gone to college there, um, they aren't given this mentality that they can do something beyond their like small bubble. Um, it's very focused on you know get a good job after you go to college or um, there's a, there's a there's a there's a very defined path. Um, and I think although this is very idealistic and I think difficult to implement um, in other places that just that idea that there doesn't have to be a concrete path to follow um, and there there's room for exploration. Uh, I think that is really important. Really quickly, things like the UROP program, the first time my research advisor left me alone with some glue, screws, and a soldering iron, uh, I was absolutely terrified. But the experience of actually figuring out what the problem I was trying to solve was, how I would go about doing it, being treated as an equal part in the research process was absolutely transformative for me. Two questions, so uh, I'm okay if you give uh, short answers. So my first question is about peer-to-peer um, -peer learning. Um, so how far down uh, the education, uh, so elementary or high school, do you think we can push ubiquitous peer-to-peer -peer learning? So for example, maybe juniors and seniors in high school can have most of their classes taught by uh, students that are two years older than them, for example. And then I have another question. I can accelerate quickly for the Montessori system. Pushes it all the way to kids. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let, let's be honest. Yes. Children can learn from other children. They can learn from exact peers, and one's a little older. But there's always a manager of this process. Your, I don't know if it's your idea or other people's ideas that we'll just have 12-year-olds uh, teach 10-year-olds and 14-year-olds teach 12 years old is part of a, a, a major assault on the notion of expertise and knowledge. And while it is better to involve people in teaching each other and working in groups, that can be exaggerated to believe that we'll just get rid of everybody over 25, is what I said when I was 18, and let everybody else take care of it. We do repeat errors if we don't learn history. And we haven't learned history very well. Thank you. I, I think we definitely agree. Uh, we, we need, <laughs> <laughs> we definitely need old, like uh, more mature facilitators of the education process. Um, my second question is about. Uh, uh, integrating um, artificial intelligence and, and technology education um, as far down the education ladder. Uh, do you think um, uh, 
do, how, how far away uh, do you think, like in number of years, maybe 10, 15 years, do you think it will be like compulsory for, um, I don't know, l let's say 20% of the world's children to uh, learn like STEM, um, the STEM mindset from, from young age? Do you mean to learn science and technology or to learn through machines? What are you asking? Um, so I'm OK if you uh, attack either one of the. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK. I, I think that everybody should learn about science and technology, as well as literature and history and philosophy. I think I made that clear. And as for whether they should learn from machines, I think I made that clear. Uh, I apologize if I, I was you, you get another one, because those two didn't work. Try again. <laughs> uh, so, like it should be possible, but I don't think we're even close. I mean, I think a good teacher is trying to figure out how the student's misunderstanding something. It's almost psychoanalysis, uh, you know, getting into the uh, their foundations, assumptions. I, we're not even close. I'd love to say yes, because I'm Mr. Open Learning, but we're not there. It's, it's, I mean, it's not even like, I can't even see it on the horizon, you know. I, I think learning is a relationship between people. And um, so I, I, I feel differently about it. I think that you, uh, you know, you, you, it's only when people are together that they, um, the, the teacher has that ability to convey the importance of the subject to, 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 the, to the student. I mean, you can learn things on a textbook and from videos and so on, and I think, you know, very targeted kinds of things can be learned that way too. But if you really want to learn a, a subject, especially for young people, I think it's important to have an older person there. Also, teaching is not just about learning course content. One of my most important educational moments came from crying in a professor's office hours because I didn't think I was good enough to be a scientist. That's something that an AI professor wouldn't have been able to help me with. <laughs> it's like, that's not compute. <laughs> 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 just, to, just to clarify what I said, because I am the vice president for open learning, what I'm saying is, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that I, a motivated and curious student can learn a lot from content because they're intelligent. But assume that the intelligence can come from the machine to coach them and to, again, analyze what they've misunderstood, that we have, we, we're not even close. Thank so we have a job. Thank heavens. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I think another thing is um, when I interact with a professor who knows a lot, I can see myself attaining that one day because they're also a human being. And no, 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 not all of them. <laughs> in my experience. <laughs> Um, and so you can you can see yourself fulfilling that role, and there's that like level of inspiration and excitement that you can only get from a human being because there's no way you're ever going to be a well. You, why would you want to be a computer program? But. Yeah. I think we should have a machine on the panel to represent that <laughs> 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 their indispensability. I, I mean, you ask a bunch of humans, are we indispensable? Well, I was wondering what, about Sanjay. <laughs> I was, what kind I was of answers do you expect? Um, <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna poke him and see if he's. That's the one of one amongst us is in fact a machine. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the question I have actually come vaguely out of this conversation so far is um, how can we in, incorporate failure better into our models of education, especially MIT? I don't think there is learning without failure, and one always thinks model stuff and success. I think there's yeah. A panel in a couple of weeks on people telling stories about failing. And I have been invited, and I'm so nervous <laughs> what to reveal. <laughs> There's so much that could be said. You know, Shankar, the earlier question that Hazel asked about what would you take from MIT and take it elsewhere, outside of curiosity, the second thing I would say is failure, actually. I mean, I, I think that at MIT we're much more, uh, and, and we're not you know, the best. I don't think you always use failure. I know, but I think in other countries. <laughs> you fail all the time. You know, we do, but. Uh, yeah. No, but in other countries, I mean, other education systems, learn. failure is so shunned and uh, it's hidden and sort of brushed under the carpet that, you know, we don't learn from it. Uh, 
Let me, um, oh, please go ahead, yeah. You took his jacket off, the same person. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he has another change of clothing <laughs> I mean, I'm taking the chance because, uh, you know, there was no one lined up. So uh, <laughs> I, I want to ask about, uh, uh, do you think there will be a progress made in the near future in, in establishing um, like a, a cross-national body uh, that helps uh, beef up education in, in other parts of the world? Go talk to Professor Siv. <laughs> <laughs> There's something called the Jamil World Education Lab, which looks at pre-kindergarten through grade 12, higher ed, and workforce learning, which is exactly for that. Thank you. Let me take this opportunity to um, do uh, three last items. Um, the first one is to tell you uh, that there's a reception after this where you can continue these conversations um, with um, some of our panelists, and it is in 6104, which is um, just down the hall. <coughs> um, so that's the first item. The second item is I, again, want to congratulate our fantastic uh, four new uh, McVickers. And the third item is to thank our seven panelists for just a fantastic and engaging um, you know, opportunity to um, hear your thoughts about um, education. So thank you all. Thank you.